Hi everybody, welcome to Blockbusting, the podcast where we love to hate the movies. I'm your host, Jay Light. Joining me today, J.F. Harris. Hello, audience. Hello, J.F. Hello, Jay Light. How are you? I'm good, man. I can't complain. Uh, It's funny to now I feel like we're about to get into the same exact conversation we just had about how I'm doing. (laughs) Uh, I'm doing good though. I can't, I really, life's, life's good at the moment. That's good. Yeah. We don't have, we're not going to go in depth. This isn't an industry podcast. This is about a movie you hate. Uh, Yeah. One you brought to my attention I've never seen before. Yeah, nice. The Limits of Control. The Limits of Control. A Jim Jarmusch movie. Yes. I, you go ahead. Uh, say your thing. I'm a huge Jim Jarmusch fan. He is possibly my favorite director. So I've never seen Jim Jarmusch, any of his work. I've heard of it. I've you know I've obviously heard of him as a director. I know his movies, uh, you know, Broken Flowers and Coffee and Cigarettes and Patterson and all this other stuff that he's directed over the years. This is my first exposure to Jim Jarmusch. Why did you do this to me? <laughs> Why did you give me the fir- the bad ones to start with? Well, that's the that I did it because it's the premise, <laughs> the premise of your of podcast. Show, I understand, but um, uh, it's funny because I rewatched it for this podcast and gotta say I gave it to you first, then rewatched it so I could know what I was going to talk about. It second watch, not as bad, really. Yeah, because I knew how boring it was going to be. Okay. I mean, it's very boring. Yes. It's a two-hour-long movie, and for those of you who haven't seen it yet, or which doesn't seem that surprising, I feel like a lot of people haven't seen this movie. It did not do well. It's a 2009 American film written and directed by Jim Jarmusch, starring Isaac de Bancole as a lone wolf assassin carrying out a job in Spain. It has a 43 on Rotten Tomatoes. It was criticized. This is the this is the first paragraph on the Wikipedia page. I know. Criticized for its slow pace and inaccessible dialogue. Yeah, but that's spot on. Yep, this movie. Yeah, it's so it's funny because <laughs> I I also had a, like a bad movie experience with this where I like took a friend who was like kind of we were like kind of it was a weird situation where I brought a friend to see this movie who was visiting New York City when I was living in New York City at the time and we both sat in the movie and did not like the movie but didn't leave because we thought the other person was enjoying the movie. Oh boy. I've never been in one of those situations quite like that before. Oh, it it was like you're just sitting there going like, all right, when's this shit going to end or when's something going to happen? It's a large part of the movie is like uh I will say this to defend this movie, oh, uh, boy. which is weird cuz I'm I watched it the second time. Uh it I'm happy he made this movie. Okay. Because of the fact that it, I could see how it really influenced and helped shape the next two movies that followed it. Mm-hmm. If like he learned from this movie and made two better movies so from this movie. What are the, let me um, let me just look. What are the movies he made after this? Patterson uh, and the last two Lovers Alive. Oh yeah, and those both have uh, t- yeah. I I have only Lovers Left Alive ready on my computer to watch at some point. It's amazing. I've it's, heard it's great. It might be his. I think that and Patterson are maybe, I don't want to say they're his two best movies, because pretty much all of his movies are fantastic. I've heard Ghost Dog is really good. Ghost great. Dog's really good. Ghost Dog's not my favorite, but it's really good. Dead Man. Dead Man's phenomenal. Like, he's probably my favorite director, and this movie was just so not good. So let's talk about... Before we really get into this movie, especially now that you've had a change of heart on it, which is crazy, it's I'd love to hear about more about that. It's not a massive change of heart, but when you're watching it the second time around and you know that it's going to be not an anticlimactic movie, but it's just kind of like, it's kind of a plotless movie. Or not plotless. Oh, it's definitely a plotless movie. Yeah. It's the plot of this movie basically amounts to, hey, Eventually, you're going to have to strangle Bill Murray with a guitar string, <laughs> but it's going to take you a sev- It's going to take you a really long time to get there. Yeah, and you're just going to hang out with a naked lady a bunch, right? So naked for 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 no reason, none. But that's also what's kind of uh, like this. Ho- the whole movie, I think, is supposed to be like: Is this a dream? Is this happening in somebody's head? Yeah. Well, I is mean, is this a poem? This is the part, there's a part in this movie that has, I've only really experienced 
a feeling watching this movie the way I did when I was watching. There's this movie called A Ghost Story. Are you familiar with that? No. Okay. So A Ghost Story is one of my least favorite movies of all time. Okay. There's a sequence, and, and the pre- the premise of A Ghost Story is Casey Affleck and Rooney Mara play this couple. I'm already not in. And they're and they play a young couple, and Casey Affleck dies. And then he becomes a ghost. And not just like a film ghost where it's like, oh, it's his body and nobody can see him. Like a fucking Halloween Charlie Brown Peanuts ghost where it's just a sheet. Oh, that's funny. With eye holes cut out. And the whole movie is played to be very serious, and it's ruined, and it's like the grief and loss, and then all of a sudden it's like him traveling through time and space and the house decaying. And there's a sequence in the middle of the movie where the ghost is at this house party that's taking place at the house that he's hunting, and there's a guy who's just like, yeah, art's bullshit. This mo- this is like people, you know, nothing matters. It's all bullshit. It doesn't really matter what anybody makes or does. It's super stupid. And I was like, why are you telling me this in the middle of your movie? You're tell you're showing your hand is like I tricked you into watching this movie about how I think art is bullshit. About how I think art is bullshit, and that's kind of how I felt when Tilda Swinton shows up in the middle of the movie and says, "You know, I sometimes I like movies where nobody talks and movies that feel really weird and meta." And I'm like, "You're doing you're doing it again." Yeah. You're doing it again. Yeah, you're saying that this is maybe that's what this movie is. Not even saying maybe. That's yeah. I think that she's laying out, "Yeah, this movie is dumb and plotless." But you gotta you gotta watch it. You, you're sucked in because maybe it'll be cool. Yeah, yeah, and that's kind of what the movie. It, the movie is kind of like I think it's his version of like like a like a neo realist film or something like that. Like it's his version of like the movies that probably really influenced him, mm-hmm. and it's his like a bunch of the actors that he likes to work with. Like right. two of those actors are in uh, the only two lovers alive. Right, like. Um, and that's it's kind of how a lot of his movies are, and there's a ton of repetition, which is like done masterfully in like uh, Patterson. But in this, it just feels kind of meandering. But the second time I watched it, I could see it more than the first time. Instead of being like, "Oh, this is super boring," I was like, "Oh, he's doing that thing again. He's doing that thing again. He's doing that thing again." Right. He's like trying to make a stylistic choice with it, which I probably noticed the first time too, but I was just so bored with how slow and pointless the movie was. Right. I mean, you're yawning talking about it right now, and that was a sneeze, but it's all... Look, I remember I watched this movie just l- almost an hour or two before you came here. So Me too. I rewatched it about an hour ago. I'm glad that it's so fresh in our minds. I would like to ask you, besides the whole level of awkwardness that you felt watching this movie with your friend in New York and thinking that they were enjoying it and vice versa, how did you feel leaving the theater? Did oh, you guys talk about it? Yeah, we were both li- like, oh, that was an hour of our, two hours of our life. We can't get back. <laughs> Like, we could have been hanging out as friends talking. Because it was like a friend who didn't live in New York City at the time. Mm-hmm. They lived, I forget where they lived, in either Chicago or St. Louis or something. And it was kind of like, well, that was a bummer. You know what I mean? Right. Like, yeah. I was trying to be like, let's go see a cool art house movie. We're young. We're in New York City. We're going to be cool people. Right. Yeah. I love Jim Jarmish. Stranger Than Paradise is the coolest. Down by Law is the coolest. Right. Yeah. Night on Earth is the coolest mystery trains the coolest and then we went in and it's just like all right cool like all of his other movies too kind of have a meandering quality about them Mm -hmm. but they're also like are captivating in a really interesting way that i feel like this movie kind of didn't have yeah even tilda swinton's performance in this and i love tilda swinton she's one of my favorite actors Mm -hmm. she her performance in this is like bad. Yeah, it's pretty bad. It, like, and it sucks. And knowing that she's Tilda Swinton, it makes me just go, "Oh, he just picked like bad takes." There's so much of this movie. It feels like it feels like there's a lot of bad choices that were happening on the part of Jim Jarmusch. Yes. Now, as someone, I, I, as someone who's not seen his work, can you describe a little bit as a fan what you like about his movies, just in general? Um. Well, the thing I really like about his movies is that they're kind of tonally different from anybody else's movies. Okay. And when I was younger, getting into like film and movies as a like a kid in my early twenties, like they felt like really rebellious and like deep and like curious, and then they also were like super infused with a lot of other art. Okay. If that makes sense. Like, there's always like t- references to poetry and philosophy, and you know, there's always like 
really interesting, diverse casts. Yeah. And like, you know, they're they're just like and they're also just like a little off and a little funny and a little fun. Mm-hmm. This movie and Limits of Control kind of has it has a lot of that. I wouldn't say the funny or fun parts are there. That's I uh, maybe but. maybe that's part of it. Maybe because all the other movies have more of a sense of humor and this one's so straightforward, not funny. Right. Where even Last Two Lovers Alive is a more is like one of his more serious movies, I would say, but it's got funny parts in it. Mm-hmm. And the characters are all funny, where this is just kind of like a straight ahead, like poetic nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> but, or not even a nightmare, but it's like a dream into. And it, but it like plays with like weird, like it's, I would almost say like, f- like foreshadowing and post shadowing and like. Yeah. This movie all exists in the shadows. Yeah. This is this this is the the spiritual reference to what we do in the shadows. Because <laughs> yeah. this movie entirely exists in shadow, for post otherwise. Yeah. This it takes it it takes it's not even that it's so slow that I was had I had such a problem with too. It's that it's slow and doesn't really do anything with the slowness other than give you admittedly very cool shots, shots and it's good be- imagery. Yeah, it's beautiful imagery, it's beautiful to watch. The people who are in it are beautiful to watch, mm-hmm. but like it, it needed another thing. If that makes sense, right? It can't exist in just this world of. It's a movie. You know what it felt like to me watching it. I was like, this movie feels like a like not just a, a an art movie with a capital A. It feels like it's all caps screaming at you. Hey, this is art, yes. guys. Yeah, believe me, it's yeah. art. I yeah. promise. Yes, and. uh but and, and but I'm like happy he took the shot if that makes sense. But also an- another, I'm so afraid Jim Jarmusch will hear this and not like me. And he's my favorite. <laughs> I met him once in my life, and I was so I've only been like starstruck once in my life, and it oh, was yeah. walking past him on a street in New York City. Uh, but the other thing I will say about this, it feels like because you know how now like you know how Woody Allen went to Europe and made some movies because you're like there was like money over there, right? Yeah, it kind of felt like there was a Barcelona f- or a Spanish film board who was like, hey, we'll give you a bunch of money to make Spain look cool as a like as a backdrop, so maybe more people will come to Spain. Yeah, maybe. But then you got to make a movie that's actually good. Uh, yeah, and people are gonna want to go hang out in Spain to go see. Oh, look at this! Look at all these cool coffee shops. And all these cool locales because he's going to parts of Spain I'd never heard of. Yeah, and everybody knows you know like your Madrids and your Barcelonas and, and yeah and Seville is that's in Spain right? Yeah, I hope I, so. I'm I, glad I got that one right. I, I'm pretty sure I'm it pretty is. Pretty sure it is. But nobody, I can't imagine watching this movie and being in. I was. I this kind of makes me not want to go to Spain because I feel like it's going to be. Oh, you should totally go to Spain. As boring as this movie is. <laughs> That's funny. Makes Spain look boring. I hear Spain is not a boring country. No, it's great. It's a fucking party. It's it, Spain is that naked lady all the time in the movie. <laughs> That's kind of what Spain is. Okay. And that cool waiter who's like smoking and accidentally fucks up and brings him two espressos in one cup. Yeah, I kind of. You see, there's parts of this movie that I I can see what he's trying to do. It's like it's the artifice of the movie of 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 a movie being a movie. Yeah is all laid out and I don't like that I can see the strings. Yeah. In this movie in particular. Yeah. I yeah, I feel like it almost feels like this movie could have been a better movie if it was a silent movie. Yeah. You know what? You're total I think I think you're actually onto something there. Like it was uh cuz it it felt a li- yeah, it was like a little too heavy-handed. Like it was trying to be beautiful and poetic, and it just kind of missed it by being a little heavy-handed, where if it, you would have almost been better, I feel like you would have got the point across saying nothing. Mm-hmm. And that is a really bold stylistic choice that yeah. I haven't seen. I've never seen a Hitman movie that's a silent film. Yeah. I think that would be a really unique take on this. Yes. And it also solves another problem which this movie has, which is it's too fucking long. Yeah, this movie didn't need to be that long. You can shop this. When I saw that this movie was two hours long, I got I immediately got worried. Yeah. Because I have I have no problem with movies that go to be two hours or longer, but they have to make the comp- the point they have to make the argument while you're watching it that it should be that long. Yes, one of my other, sorry, this made me think of another problem I have with the movie. Oh, say it. It's not even a problem with the. It's the trailer makes you think it's going to be a really cool different movie. What's the trailer like? I remember watching it when I was in theaters, and like it's like the guy walking down the street with a guitar case, and you know he's a hitman. It's all these cool locations, and it was like kind of like 
moody and f- even fast cuts a bit, and mm-hmm. you're like, oh, this is going to be like a crazy, cool Jim Jarmusch action movie, and then it's just like, it's a dude doing Tai Chi in a hotel room. You right. Know? <laughs> and listening to LCD sound system in a in a bar. Yeah. It doesn't make, you know, it's like, okay, yeah, I get what you're doing with, oh, he they're carrying a violin or a guitar case. That's a Hitman thing. There's a weapon inside there. Yeah. No, it's actually a guitar. Yeah. Oh, okay, I see. You great. Wink, wink. Nudge, nudge. Yeah. Fun times. You flip that. You really flip the genre on its head, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> it, it. You know. It's 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 a bummer. <laughs> it but, is. But at the same time, I'm happy he made it. I'll say it again because the next two movies phenomenal. So talk to me about. You watch this movie once. You have this reaction to it. It's your least favorite of his work. Yes. Now watching it again, is there stuff that you disliked about it the first time that your opinion changed on besides just, Oh, I see what he was using to set up for his, for stylistic choices in future movies. Uh, what changed in my opinion? No, it's still not great. Uh, (laughs) Oh, good. Yeah. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's still not a great movie. It's an interesting watch, but it's slow. And it, if you were, if you, the listener, were going to watch this Jim Jarmusch movie, knowing what you know now that it's a slow movie, also know that Bill Murray is in the movie, but not as long as you want him to be, and he's really only in it for maybe three minutes of the movie. Yeah, three to five minutes tops. He's barely in this movie. And when you, when I went to go see the movie, I was like, "Oh fuck, Jim Jarmusch movie, Bill Murray. This is gonna be great." I mean, I. Guy Bernal, Bernal, how do you say his name? Guy Bernal. Gail Garcia he's, Bernal. He was like one of the best parts of the movie because he's like the most three dimensional person in the movie. Yeah, John Hurt also a really good part in this movie. Yes, because you're because it's like okay, you got you got some opinions. Yeah, that I actually care to hear about. Like yeah. that was the thing with Tilda Swinton's role in this movie is Tilda Swinton all these characters have these meetings with this with this hitman which I didn't even we haven't even talked about like the plot that is the majority of the movie which is just our hitman going to cafes and meeting people who give him matchbooks yeah. while he waits for them with his two espressos and two separate cups. And then he eats the message and then goes to the next person. Right. And they all talk about, they start off every conversation the same way, which is a like, okay, that's a hitman thing, I guess. That's like a code word phrase. Do you speak Spanish? No, I think that's honestly just the guy doesn't speak Spanish and it's just like... Oh, I see. I, see. I thought that that was like the hitman activation phrase. Like, oh, funny. Like, the, you know, like a dead drop. You know, it's like, oh, you're going to go leave that... I don't know. I don't know spy lingo. I think they all knew he didn't speak Spanish. So, yeah, you're probably right. Because he's a French actor. Oh, okay. That's the other thing, too. He's a French actor um, who's in... uh, I'm pretty sure he's in uh, uh, Night on Earth. I'm like... Night on Earth? What is that? A great Jim Jarmusch movie. Oh, okay. I Uh, gotta watch one Jim Jarmusch. I'm pretty sure he's one of the cab drivers... Uh, in the Jim Jarmusch movie, but like Night on Earth is just a movie that takes place all at the same time over like, the course of over one the night. course of one night a around night on the world. Oh. And a lot of Jim Jarmusch's best movies, like Coffee and Cigarettes, Night on Earth, uh, Mystery Cha- Train, are all these like little short vignettes that are all kind of happening at once. Okay, and then like Stranger Than like uh, Stranger Than Paradise it was his first, technically a second movie, and it's this kind of like weirdo art film that was a short film that he got more money for because people liked it and turned it, it stretched it out into a feature length. Okay. Yeah. What's Stranger Than Paradise about? Uh, it's about uh, this girl comes from Hungary uh, to stay with her cousin in New York City for a couple of day, days before she goes stays with her aunt in Cleveland. Gotcha. And it's just like the two of them kind of laying around being bums and then they don't like each other, start to get along she leaves then him and his loser friend go and get her in cleveland and they go to florida and that's kind of the plot to the movie i mean it sounds like a a very lax hangout movie which in theory i'm not opposed to i would say watch every other one of his movies i'm gonna have to and then after you watch all of his movies go back and rewatch the limits (laughs) of my control and then you go oh i see what he was trying to do there so the anyway but the point uh to get to get back to these conversations that they're having yeah everybody has a conversation about a specific topic yes and they all say you know something to the effect of like you know what i really like is x thing and the only two 
people who have a conversation. Who not? It's I, it's hard to say it's a conversation because it's really yeah. just them talking. Who has a monologue that doesn't feel like a robot? Yes, and the only two are Gail Garcia Bernal and John Hurt. Yeah, they feel like, it feels like they actually care about what they're talking about. Yes, everybody else, it's just not even and just not even just them. All the other characters in this movie, even Bo Murray, it feels very wooden. It feels yes. like they are not being directed. It, it feels yeah, a little bit, yeah, yeah. It doesn't. Well, it doesn't feel like they're people. Which right. is it's a like, weird choice. Like if you're gonna have everyone be that kind of stiff, mm-hmm. this is a dream. This isn't real. Kind of reality. Yeah. Then you can't have two of the people give really good grounded human performances. Right. And yeah, and you know what? It's not that they're not directed. It's that they're directed in this specific way. Yeah, that feels like really stilted and not three dimensional. Right. It's, Which the Tilda Swinton character is a lady who shows up in a full white ho- outfit with white hair and a clear umbrella. Like, it's really strange to begin with. Mm hmm. Which is fine, but I feel like it's like then everybody has to be that level of like, or maybe not. You well, know. it's the same thing as like Paso de Huerta is the naked lady. What's up? The, as the naked lady, she's got these lines that you, I remember hearing her say stuff like, do you like my ass? That's like this might be the first or second line she says. And it's, I, she says it like she's asking you what time it is. Yeah. Flat, no energy. And he and the only and and it's just like this. It's tossed away That's in a way it, that doesn't. Fe- it feels like there should be more to it. Yeah, but there's not. Yeah, it feels like a Bergman film, like or like something like that gone wrong. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Or not gone wrong, but like it just doesn't have any. The tone's all over the place. And maybe that's supposed to be the point of, like, our dreams are all over the place. And this is supposed to be the subconscious of his dreams. You know what I mean? But So do you feel do you feel like that would be, that's the interpretation that... The, that's the one that you I... Should, you're, you're taking away from I'm it? That I'm taking away from it. Like, this is all the shit that's banging around in Jim Jarmusch's head, right? Okay. You know, Bill Murray's, his thoughts on the Republicans... <laughs> Or something like that. <laughs> something like that. He I shows mean, up in a red tie. And then all of these people are like different aspects of things Jim Drummish thinks about a lot. Okay. You know? This is what, Tilda Swin's what he thinks about about movies. Yes. The girl on the train is what he thinks about science. Yes. John Hurt's what he thinks about people saying that they're artists. Yes. But what... And then the the woman who he doesn't have sex with is the woman he thinks about is what right. he thinks about sex. And he thinks it's just women so, wearing clear raincoats all the time. Yeah, and then she shows up in other places and so does Tilda Swinton and you see things from different points of view and it's like things are just a little bit skewed. Right. And he's and there's I mean there's a lot of repetition in this and, movie that I that, like some of it I get from a stylistic point yes. even though I don't like it. Yeah. And then some of it I didn't understand. And maybe you maybe you can help me out with this one cuz he goes to a lot of museums yes. in the movie and he's checking He goes out, to the same museum over and over again. And but and then he's seen but there's and also the le- there's that painting in the ap- last apartment. Right. But there's and this happens a couple times where there's a painting that's covered up. That's tw- just twice. The, just the twice. The, 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 the last two times. And then in the apartment, there's one covered up. And then after he's killed Bill Murray at the end of the movie. So is that, is that supposed to symbolize something? I don't know. Yeah, I think it is, but I don't know what. I get, it's not... You uh, got to be able to pick up on the symbols. Yeah. Like, I was, just, I was just talking about this with the last episode that I recorded, where if you're going to make a movie that's an art movie and you have... You know, there's symbolism in your movie, right? And yeah. this isn't even just with art house movies. There's movies, all kinds of movies have symbolism. Every movie has symbolism. Yeah. It. And you're supposed to show and not tell, and that's the whole point of the medium. But you got to have enough to connect the dots yes. to, for your audience to be able to say, oh, yeah, this links up to this, this, this links up to this, so on and so forth. Yeah. It feels like there's a lot of really, there's a lot of loose ends in this movie that you're never going to connect the dots to. Yeah. And I think that's part of it. I think that's like <laughs> a choice. I don't love the choice. <laughs> But I think part of it was like, this is my fucked up dream. <laughs> I know, man. That's that's such a such a flimsy excuse, and I'm not. I can't be mad at you for like saying that that's what it is. But I get. But, but that's what I think it is. I mean, I'm almost mad at Jim Jarmusch for making that what it is. Yeah, I could get that. Is that and is that where you were at? Or are you still like now? You can at least look at it. Now as, I look at it as like a movie that was on its way to two other things. Gotcha. And I can see like why he made this movie and why he thought this movie was gonna be a cool movie. Because mm-hmm. if you watch it, you're like, this is kind of a cool movie. It's just a miss of a movie. 
Yeah. It's a big miss. It's a big miss. And and I don't know I like well I do know why. I just said why, but like you know what I mean? Like he's such a capable good director. I I it kind of baffles it, it's a movie that kind of baffles me that he couldn't yeah. pull it up. Well, I mean if you break down some of the points about the main character about the hitman and you know Which, he's a hitman he doesn't use guns yes he he doesn't have sex when he's working yes he always wear he wears the same suit no he switches the suit three times one in Does each he? act oh i didn't even catch that yeah he Man. Wears, he, d- he wears a different suit in every act of the movie i didn't pick up on that at all yeah so in each of the three cities that they go to in the movie he wears a different he wears act. a different color he wears suit. a different color suit so he's wearing that greenish kind of one in the beginning then he switches to a brown one in the second act and then a silver one when he goes to kill the guy oh, i didn't even pick up on that yeah i feel like a dumb dumb but maybe that's how checked out of this movie i was i i th- i think that it's easily missable in this movie yeah but if you but anyway but if you're picking if you're if you're throwing down like hitman with some quirks goes to go to a foreign country for a job yeah i i'm intrigued by that premise yeah i'm intrigued by the character i want to i I would love to see this movie yes and that it, it just doesn't deliver or it delivers a completely different thing from what, what it you, sounds like it could be. What it be. sounds like it could be, yeah. Let me ask you this. Yes. Is there a... If this movie was made by a different director, one who maybe would be able to to make the story more straightforward, have some artistic touches to it, but not make it a total... This something something that should be projected on the wall at LACMA instead yeah. of in a movie theater. Yeah, and this, make more sense. Yeah, this movie feels more like a thing that should be in a museum than it a, does. Yeah, and that's also why I feel like if it had less dialogue, it would make more sense in a museum. Yeah, or actually, less dialogue might make it make more sense in a movie theater. It might, know. and that because it's like, who do I think would who do you think would have done a better job as a director for this movie? Um, it's funny. I want to say Hitchcock just because they talk about Hitchcock in the movie, but I don't think that's true. Um, uh, uh, you know what? I think um somebody like um t- uh, Tony Gilroy would be great at this movie. Oh yeah, Tony Gilroy would be good for this movie. Yeah, Tony Gilroy, who did like Michael. If you don't know who Tony Gilroy is, he did Michael Clayton. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's uh the dude who did Star Wars Rogue One. Uh, he wrote the Bourne movies. Um, and his, I, I really enjoyed Michael Clayton. Michael Clayton's my favorite movie. It, re- it really is. My that's, favorite movie. That's a great pick for a favorite movie. Yeah. It's, not, it's nice. It's outside the box. Yeah. It's, it's just like a great, I love like 70s and 70s like New York gritty films. Mm-hmm. Like everything Sidney Lament directed, everything, um, you know, that kind of time period in New York film. And, right. And that feels like, it feels like a great homage to that kind of stuff. I see. I've and never Tilda seen. Tilda Swinton's in it and she's phenomenal. Tilda oh, she's Swinton great. In that movie is the great, it's one of her greatest performances. It's the movie that broke her to the mainstream. Yes. For sure. Yeah. I remember. I, I think she it, got an Oscar. She got. Uh, or at least a nomination. I think she might have. I think, she, I know she got a nomination. I think she won. Hold on. I'm going to look this up. Now I got Michael Clayton on the brain. Because I remember, yeah. That movie, it got nominated for a lot of Oscars. Did it win? Uh, it won Best Picture. It won Best Supporting Actress. Tilda yeah. Swinton. Yeah. And it, she totally deserved it. She was and I, phenomenal. I love Tilda Swinton as an actress. I think, you know, we need to talk about Kevin, one of my all time favorite movies. Uh, Top 20 for The me. D- director who directed that uh, is phenomenal. Lynn Ramsey. Yeah. She did Rat Catcher, and um, she just did the new one. The with, new one, with, uh, uh, You Were Never Really Here. Here, which was also kind of a fucked up movie like this, and, but also held your attention. You know what? And it's not just a fucked up, it's a, it's a fucked up movie about a hitman yeah. that has a lot of artistic touches, a, a very silent part for the most part. Yes. And carries you through the whole movie. Mm-hmm. I think... I would have loved to have seen what Lynn Ramsey would have done with this script. If Jim Jarmusch wrote the script for this movie, I feel like Lynn Ramsey is the kind of director who could have taken this movie and made it exciting. I think that's a good call. That would be great. That, that's the other thing, too. I think that's the problem with this movie is that we don't ever feel like the lead character is in real peril. No. He's always he's always in control. Yeah. There are no limits to his control. Yeah. He's got it. He understands everything. What's the limits of my control. Yeah. It's funny, and I really do believe that. Like that's maybe that's maybe that's the problem because movies are about stakes, and you don't ever feel any stakes in this movie. Yeah, it's just you know, there's there's just nothing that really 
it feels like a movie that was kind of, I mean, a, an art movie with that's screaming at you, but also a movie that's like, okay, yeah, people are going to watch this. Teenagers who have tumblers are going to watch this and post the the screen caps from this, and they're going to and they're going to feel like they made a good call. Yeah, yeah, it's it's just. Uh... Yeah, I'm bummed out that it's not a better movie for people to watch. It's okay. But other Jim Jarmusch okay. movies are good. Every other one is great. I gotta watch Broken it. Broken Flowers is the only other one that I wasn't like, that was perfect. Broken Flowers, I'm like, that was pretty good. So for the Jim Jarmusch uninitiated, including me, what are your top three must-watch Jim Jarmusch movies? Top three must-watch, Only Two Lovers Left Alive. Okay. Uh, which I think I've said the name wrong every single time I've said it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Patterson. But see, that's the problem. I think you need to see the early stuff to to enjoy. You don't need to see the early stuff, but knowing the early ones, gotcha, makes the I think the later ones better because he gets so much better. And it's kind of watch Stranger Than Paradise, which is his first one. Okay, and then watch uh, Only Two Lovers Left Alive and Patterson. Okay, I'm gonna watch those. Yeah, I've got I've got Only Lover Le- oh, blah, Only Lovers Left Alive on my computer, ready to watch. Haven't done it yet. Do it. I got no excuse now. Uh, Patterson is uh, on Amazon Prime. If you have Prime, I do. Then you can watch that because it's an Amazon movie. Uh, and then Stranger Than Paradise, I own on Criterion DVD. I will lend you. I would love to borrow that. Yeah. Ah, uh, the Criterion Collection. Did I ever tell you I had to get? I I used to be a big DVD guy, and then I had to sell all my DVDs. Yeah. Did I ever tell you about this? No. When I was first living in LA, I was dating a girl. And we were dating long distance, and then she moved in with me, and that was the, that was the reason why she moved to L.A. It was to, it was for us to continue dating, but she said she would only move to L.A. if we lived together, and so I agreed, even though I knew it was a bad idea because love, right? And we broke up, and we still lived together for a couple months after we were broken up, and then a bunch of shit went down, and I had to leave the apartment, and I was. You you should give a little bit of context because a bunch of shit went down. Could be like I murdered her. I didn't murder her. She's still alive. <laughs> Basically, I sh- I'm got I got to figure out what's the most condensed way I can tell the story. Ah, fuck it. Who cares? I'll edit this podcast later on anyway. We'll get rid of the silences. There's a a point where we were both doing this kind of dance where it wasn't totally clear to me whether we were going to be trying to get back together or whether I should be dating other girls. Yes. Because I was like truly getting mixed messages where she would say, you should be going out on dates with people, but then also she would get mad at me. If you going not, plan- not even going out on dates, but not planning dates with her. So it sounds like she loosely wanted to be in an open relationship. But, not, but she had also said we're broken up. And she gave me a fucking letter that said we need to not be dating. Well, then that means you're broken up. Exactly. But it was very difficult to tell what was supposed to be going on. The the, the whole, this all comes to a head. There was a day I had I had brought a date to from Tinder to a comedy show, and my ex showed up to that show, and I they both sat at the same table. Whoa. And things no. did not go well after that. The next morning, my now ex girlfriend, uh, and and then ex girlfriend too. I don't know why I had to clarify any yeah. time frames. It's just very confusing. But she confronted me, and she was like, "You have to leave this apartment. I will not. I will not stand for you bringing girls back to this apartment." Because and she was, and I was like, I was just wanting to get out of that situation. Yeah. So much that I was like, "Fuck it, fine. Yeah. I'll be. I'll leave. I'll get all my stuff out." Because it was already weird enough that I felt it was just like, yeah, it, that's it, just, a, it just felt uncomfortable constantly. Yeah, yeah, that sounds like a real like uh, clusterfuck of a situation. It was. It was a real clusterfuck. I got myself in some bad, some bad times when I was in my early twenties. Yeah, well, that's what your early twenties are for. Exactly. Mistakes. But so then I moved out. I was still. On the hook for rent because I was on the lease yeah. for that apartment, and I was also living in a friend of mine's basement, so I had to basically pay. I, I was only, luckily my friend super discounted rent only made me pay a hundred bucks yeah per month to stay in his basement, which is I could handle yeah. But I still had to pay f- half rent at this other place, which was not great. So I was scrambling for money at one point, and I sold all of my DVDs to Amoeba Music. Oh, man. I and bet you can go back there and get them for a lot cheaper now. I certainly could. But you know what was one of the most disheartening things was taking movies, like Criterion Collection movies, Which you right? paid a lot of money for, probably. Right. And then they give me back either $2 or 
sorry, we have too much of this movie already. Oh my we god, can't, you can't sell it. And I'm like, can you please just take it off my? I have no, I have no use for this. Just take it off my hands. I'm homeless. I live in a basement. <laughs> you, you're not gonna take my, you're not gonna take my Royal Tenenbaums DVD, which everyone has it, or or did at one point in time. See, I thought I was special, and I thought I was the only one, but. Yeah. That's the thing. That's what Wes Anderson does to you. It makes you feel like the only special boy. There's a great Instagram called Accidentally Wes Anderson that I recommend <laughs> everybody follow. And it's just things around the world that are very Wes Anderson y. I have to check that out. Accidentally Wes Anderson? Yeah. You know, speaking of Instagrams, by the way, you've been a great guest. Thank you. I try. Just to throw that out there, you've been, this is, I, I am going to go watch some other Jim Jarmish. Please, I gotta check everyone it out. who's listening, please go watch some Jim Jarmish. He's great. This one missed the target, but it's an important movie because it got him to other movies. Funny that a hitman movie missed the target. <laughs> Bingo. Where can the listeners find you on the internet, Instagram uh, and otherwise? Instagram is at the JF Harris. Um, uh, I would love it if you followed me. I'll post shows and stuff like that on there. Twitter is also at the JF Harris. And then uh, I tour a lot. So if you're in any city, chances are I will be there in the next year in America. Uh, my website is www.jfharris.com. And it's JF like the initials, J and F. Mm -hmm. um, it's not some other weird thing. J-A-Y-E-F-F. -F. So yeah, it's not that. But that's what it sounds like phonetically. It's a good it's a good way to describe it. Yeah. Thank you for laying that all out for us. Yeah. You can find me at Diet J on Twitter and Instagram, jlightcomedy.com for show dates. And if you like the podcast, leave a review, leave a rating, subscribe, tell a friend. Give Jay five stars, man. Give me some stars, guys. I mean, why wouldn't... I don't get that. If someone's listening to this point, you like Jay as a human being, so just go give him five stars and make his life a little bit easier. Yeah, why not? Uh, I appreciate all you guys do as listeners. And if you want to get in on the conversation with me and JF, just hit us up after you listen to this episode. Yeah, we'll, if you were we'll like, I think. loved Limits of Control, I found it riveting, tweet at me. <laughs> I can't imagine anybody thinking that. Imagine if Jim Jarmusch tweeted at me after this. I would be, and he was just like, "You're a fucking asshole." I'd be so like, "I'm sorry, dude," but you also know you missed on this one. I think he probably did. Yeah, but it's okay, Jim. If you're listening, hey, come on my podcast. <laughs> yeah, well, I would or, love to have you. Or and, let's just get together and talk about poetry. Have some coffee and cigarettes. Talk about Rimbaud. Yeah, <laughs> this has been blockbusting. Go see something good for a change. <laughs>